Good morning. Hey, there it is. What do you think of the tie? I got up this morning and I said, I want to look pretty for church. Not handsome, pretty. Right? Praise the Lord. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I want to share something with you this morning that I shared on Wednesday, but I feel that it has to be shared again because this is a really powerful testimony. Uh, there's this girl that I went to music school with, and I went to high school with her husband. I haven't seen them for years, but my mom knows who they are. Uh, he's a worship leader at the church that they go to, and uh, I don't know if she's in the children's ministry or what. But right now, they are in Tennessee in a children's hospital because their youngest son uh, was diagnosed with cancer two years ago. So this is something that she wrote on Facebook on January 29th, and I'm going to read it to you, and I'm going to be translating here as I read, so bear with me. It says, two years ago today, our lives were changed. We received the news that no parent wants to hear. Your child has a tumor, he has cancer, and it's terminal. Throughout these two years, we have cried, we have laughed, we have despaired, there has been frustration. There have been moments that we have not understood. Our hearts have been broken several times. We have talked about birthdays. We have even planned a funeral twice. We have asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? With a hole in our heart, we have cheered every progress on his physical therapies. We have stayed quiet when his pain cannot be comforted with just a hug. But today, regardless of all that, we can say that we are better human beings, better parents, better husband and wife, better friends, and we have grown so much closer to God than in any other circumstances of our lives. Today, those that are our true friends, you know who you are. In these two years, we have come to know compassion and how much a city can come together to give to those that need. Today, we continue down this path knowing that the Lord has kept us all this time. Kevin, that's his name, has contradicted every diagnosis over and over. Today, he smiles, he sings, he grabs my hand and we dance. He likes to go shopping and listen to his dad, Ronald, sing and play the guitar. He keeps eating his Vienna sausages and he likes the carrot Cheetos, which is what he calls Funyuns. <laughs> God continues to be faithful. We continue to believe him. And even though we don't see the road, we know that he will lay it in front of us. Two years. It seems like a short time, but to us, it's been an eternity. But today we continue to declare life. The Father will decide, and he always knows best. Amen. So I was talking to my mom about this. Uh, and, and on Wednesday, I mentioned that he had turned six recently. Actually, he just turned four. Uh, and one thing that she mentioned that, that actually uh, got to me was she said that one day his mom told him, Kevin, are you scared? And he said, no, mom, I'm not. Why is that? Because I have Jesus in my heart. Mm. <laughs> He's only four. Come on. Yeah. So as I was reading my Bible app this morning, the verse of the day today, I think it applies to this situation, and this should serve as an encouragement and as a reminder to us that no matter that it, what it is that we're facing in our life, God is always going to be there. He's always going to take care of us no matter what it is that's happening because his word is the only truth in this world and in heaven anywhere. So Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, 
sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You know, when we speak the word of God over our lives, like he says in Ezekiel, where he talks about the dry bones, those dry bones are those pieces of our lives that stop moving according to the will of God. But when we speak the word of God to those dry bones, those areas of our life that are not moving according to his will and his plan, they're going to come to life and the manifestation of what he promised, you're going to see it with your eyes. That's what I have this morning. Share a testimony, prayer request, question. Tammy, sorry. Her prohibition. Hi, girls. Jericho, do your thing. Um, on my way to church this morning, I was singing a song that um, I wrote or whatever, made up, whatever, uh, that the Lord gave me. And as I was singing it, all I could hear was, Am I a songwriter? songs that we uh, play here when we're doing worship is uh, worthy of it all. And it's not because it sings about Jesus. It's because it sings to him. Amen. Yeah. If you, if you read the, the words, it says you are worthy. The elders will bow to you. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, Mark. <coughs> um, speaking of Mark, <laughs> <laughs> tire that's what I was going to do. I was going to go over the flat tire. And as I left church one day, I, I went by uh, Lake Phil Shard out here, and I saw, I, and I've been looking at it as I drive by on my route, I've been looking at a Ford Escape. And so I, I thought, well, I'll stop in and look at it. And on Sundays, you know, these high-pressure salesmen can come out and bother me. <laughs> You've been approved. We got a couple options for the 
said he told the people on that ship, don't be afraid. This ship cannot see because I'm on it. And I have a promise from God. And so I felt like I had every right to tell that lady that. The same as everybody in here has had a promise from God. To fulfill. And you know, I've gone back and I've thought, now, Lord, did you say that promise to protect both me or my seed? Like Abraham, you know, the promise was fulfilled in his seed. And it's still clear down. And I thought and thought about that, but I'll tell you what, the Lord spoke to me. He didn't say anything about my seed, about it. Has it been fulfilled? No. Will it be fulfilled? As sure as the sun comes up in the east and goes down in the west, our God, whose word is forever settled, and whose promises are with
Sunday, we took a four hour or usually two and a half hour trip. So mm-hmm. it wasn't very good, but we just thank God that we got out there safely yeah. and yeah. got her back home. But we was able to spend some good time with her. They gave us a, a longer time to actually see her. So that, that worked out good, and especially on Monday. And so I just thank the Lord for that. But just really pray for Viviana. She's kind of in a real tough place right now. Uh, she wants to get out of there in this other facility. Thank you for using us as testimony of who you are, of your love, your power, your grace, so that we can go out into this world, Father, and show others your light that shines through us. Father, we pray for those that are not here, those that are in need of some sort of breakthrough, whether it's financial, relational, whether it's healing, Lord. We ask right now that you touch those lives and you use them as testimony for others. Come and know who you are in some way. We thank you, Father, for taking over our hearts, for showing us your love, your love, giving us your grace, Father. In your mighty name, Jesus, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. We give our lives to you, Father, so that you use us as you see fit. Gather around, gather around, gather around, church. Come on. If there are any other prayer needs, come on up front and get prayed for. Any other prayer needs, come on up front.
ship continues. <laughs> yes. to say. Anyway, uh, announcements. Uh, February 13th, Friday the 13th. Uh, Eastern Gate House of Prayer. <laughs> we're going to go where we're led. So you can come. It's going to be good. All right, let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? <laughs> I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord reviews the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of the servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, John and Don, would you mind switching out for me? You. <laughs> you, sir. <laughs> now can you say the blessing, please? worship <clears throat> we need a drummer James would you mind is there a drummer in the house yeah we have about three of them glory hallelujah Woo. hallelujah It's on. Because every knee will bow. Yes. And every tongue confess. Yes. Jesus Christ, he is Lord forever. Because every knee
can hear the sound in this room right now. The glory, the glory, the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Because I can hear the sound of people shouting. I can hear the voices ringing out. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. coming down I can hear the sound of the river coming down I can hear the sound of the river coming it coming down I can hear the sound of the river coming down I can hear the sound of the river coming down I can hear the sound of the river coming down I can hear the sound of the river coming down I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming. It's coming down. It's coming down. It's coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming. It's coming down. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. 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 It's being poured out. 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 Cause I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming. It's coming down. It's coming down. It's coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming. It's coming down. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. 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 Your sons and daughters. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. It's being poured out. 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 It's coming down, it's coming down, it's coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. It's being poured out, 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 it's being poured out. Oh, no.
coming down, it's coming down, it's coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming. It's coming down. It's coming down. It's coming down. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Let it come down. Let it come down. Let it come down. Let it come down. It's on. It's on.
right now, I want you to, in Jesus' name, call it. Woo! Tell the world to give it up right now. It has no power over it. It has no hold over it. Right now, the Lord is calling you, He's calling me, He's calling all of us to come to Him, to go out into this world and declare His word. Show this world who He is. He is the only one, the mighty Jesus, Messiah, our Savior, our only God. Right now, come on, call it out. Hallelujah. All of the names, all of those who are the hope of this world. Send your wind and your rain. But breathe upon the coals of the dormant bride of the church that is so smothered in religiosity and doctrine. Let your wind permeate that shell, Lord. Cause the embers to stir. Cause them to stir. Cause them to stir. Cause them to stir. Awaken.
Send your fire, Lord. Send your fire, Lord. Consume us with your presence, Lord. Mm, let the kingdom, Lord, that you have placed with us, Lord, manifest yourself. Glorify yourself. Glorify your name. Be lifted high. Be lifted high. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Move within and stir our spirit, Lord. With your Holy Spirit, Lord. Come, Lord. Come. the gifts that is within us Lord when we received your Holy Ghost not to be contained but revealed to a dying world Lord give us revelation and understanding Lord your kingdom principles Lord to release your holiness, your holiness, to release your power to a dying world. Lord, let us not contain it. Let us not contain it. Let us pour out that you will pour in more. Let us pour out that you will pour in more, more and more, more upon a dying world. More, Lord, more, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord.
right now. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord has been moving from the very beginning of the service. We're so grateful. Amen. For his presence. Amen. For where the presence of the Lord is, there's fullness of joy. Praise the Lord. There's, there's an expectation that God's going to do something. And if you'll just believe it, amen, you can leave here different than you came. Hallelujah. You can leave here with your need met. You may not see it in front of you right now, but just as you've heard it testified to all morning, amen, it is finished. Hallelujah. It's just a question of us believing it. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap as you're seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Thank you, worship team, as always. Great. Appreciate the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If I stand more on this side this morning, you'll know it's only because that side could go to the street. Hallelujah. Before long with everything over there. Praise the Lord. One shift your all your change to the other pocket, to the northernmost. Hallelujah. Praise God. Appreciate everybody here this morning. Grateful for you coming out and being a part of what God's doing here today. Hallelujah. And the Sunday school may be dismissed. The young ones can go downstairs. And I have a lot of scriptures, so Sheila, limber up. <laughs> or take the leave or whatever it takes get it going. Amen. Speaking from a few years beyond you, but praise the Lord. We're going to start with uh, Romans chapter 3, and I'd like to uh, let's read from uh, verse 21 through 28. That's Romans chapter 3, 21 through 28, and it's appropriate that I want to talk to you about faith this morning. Uh, everything we've talked about, in fact, everything about our faith in Christ is I'd be redundant to say it, but I will anyway. It's about faith. So uh, it's probably good that we know something about it. Amen. Now, I don't know about any of y'all, but I've been watching, uh, you know, I watch Christian TV. I don't watch it. It's not the only thing I watch. So, you know, back up and relax. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. But I, but I do watch it, and there are certain shows that I watch. There are others I just don't watch them because they just, quite frankly, I think it's just bunk. I just don't think it amounts to a whole lot of, other than just jabbering. And this last week, I made a point to go through and check out different programs throughout the week. Not to be critical, but just to see what's going on, if anything's changed, you know, if, any, if there's anything different than what I saw for the last 10 years. And I'm telling you, for any of you that haven't been watching, there's like two programs, and I won't say who, and I'm not going to get into all that, but there's like two programs that aren't doing what everybody else is doing. Now, there may be others, but these are just the ones I see. And all the vast majority are simply out there after money. I mean, just after money. It's no other, there's no other way to say it. And it's just, it's, it's embarrassing to me to watch them. It really is. I think, who, who is sending money to these people? What is wrong with them that they don't see past the facade? I mean, it's all about get your first fruits in, get your you know seed for this and seed for that. You mix your faith with my faith, and then I'm gonna you're gonna get this if I get mine. You know, get hey look, Sally said you need to get on there. I said, I, honest to God, I couldn't do it. <laughs> not not because I'm you know I'm send me your money. You know, I'll take your money, but look, I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I'm not gonna say you know here's the I, the biblical principles are there. I get that. So you know. Give and it's given to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, men will give under your bosom. I get all that. But hey, who designated these people the one? You know, like it's only going to happen if you give it to me. I was watching one woman, she's, she does this, I mean, like three, four times a year. I think it's all she does. I've never seen her do anything else except for done everybody for money and tell them, you know, give a thousand this, you know, five thousand that. If you can't do that, you know, if she goes through the whole thing telling you, you got to give this. $770, you know, they, they, seven, seven stuff, you know. It's just gimmicky. And then, you know, before it's all said and done, she's saying, just, you know, spend 30 bucks a month, you know, that'll be, 
you won't get much of a blessing, but you know, at least you won't die in the next six months. I mean, that's the, that's the impression that you end up getting from this stuff. So, I, and they're always saying, you know, show your faith by giving your money to me. Right. Now, I understand they're, you know, we're giving as unto the Lord. But, I mean, be, be wise as serpents, you know. Just don't be foolish. I don't, you can send your money to whoever you want to send it to. If they're blessing you and, you're, and you believe in what it is, they're, I don't have a problem with that. You know that. I'm not, I'm not a person that stands up here and rants about tithing and all that kind of stuff. I believe in it. I do it myself, but that's where I leave it up to the Holy Spirit to lead people to give when there's feel led to give. There's no room for the Holy Spirit on most of Christian television because there's too much of men in there and women that are just, you know, making people feel guilty if you don't send your money to them and exorbitant amounts of money. Use your credit card. Like we don't have credit card debt already that we need to be sending another, you know. Or, or, or how about, you know, give your house to us and we'll give you like the reverse mortgage thing. Or sign over your retirement and we'll send you a check every month. Hey, sign it over to me, I'll give you a check every month, you know. <laughs> Sally will write it out, pray for <laughs> So enough of my rant. And I'm just saying, let's, we need to know what faith is. Amen. We need to know what the Bible says faith is, what Jesus says faith is, not what just some huckster, you know, is telling you. I know, I, I know this bothers a lot of people, but look, I'm not mentioning names. I'm just saying, look, just for yourself, you can discern this thing. I mean, it, it doesn't take a genius to know when you're being scammed. I don't know what their intentions are. They may have the very best of intentions. I, I can't read their minds. I only know what's coming across to me and what I've seen over the years. And it just, it just troubles me that there are good, honest, God-loving people out there that are throwing money down a rat hole, to be quite frank, when they could be doing something for the kingdom or for their own families or their own right. people in their neighborhoods, whatever. You know? right. So let's move on. But now the righteousness of God. And I want you to pay particular attention to these scriptures now because it's all what you're going to find out if you look at this unbiased, if you just look at it for what it is, just for the verbiage, you'll see that you're not doing anything. This is a declaration of what God does for us, not what we're doing for him. Because the enemy, and it's already been said by Don and others here, the enemy's, his his whole purpose is to get you under condemnation, to get you feeling guilty, to get you feeling ashamed, to get you feel... I, I was telling Sheila Wednesday night, you know, we call, we call it condemnation. Well, that word comes from condemn. Now, we know what it means to have, for example, a building is condemned. What does that mean? It means it's not fit for use. Right? So you, that's what the devil wants you to understand. That's why he brings condemnation, because he doesn't want you to think that there's any way God could use you. That you're of no value. You have no use. And he says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. And that he's not talking about carnal as we think of being carnal. He's saying you've got to operate by the spirit. The words that Jesus speaks, they're spirit and they're life. They're not legalism. They're not laws. They're finished work that Jesus has done. So with that in mind, look at this now. But now the righteousness of God, not ours, but the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, the, the law sets the standard for what righteousness is. But no human being can meet the demand of the law, which is the purpose for the law, to get us to trust in God, who is the only righteous, Right? That's, that's what he's talking about. So then in verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, and notice carefully, by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The very nicest, the very best, the most religious, they still have sinned and come short of God's righteousness. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justified freely. You've been declared just. 
and justified. And it was done freely. It didn't cost you anything. It was by his faith. You believe it, right? Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Not of him which does a lot better and then gets a lot nicer and is a lot better behaved and more moral, but just believed. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. Nobody can take any credit for it. I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how spiritual. I don't, even, I don't care how good and moral you are. You cannot boast about your own morality, your own goodness, your own accomplishments. There is no boasting. It's excluded. Why? How is it excluded? By what law? Is it the first one? I have no other gods before you? Is it, you know, thou shalt not steal? It is not committing adultery? Is it whatever? No. Of works? No. But by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Praise the Lord. That ought to settle it for everybody. I don't care denomination or whatever your, your, you know, your persuasion. That ought to take care of it anyhow. That ought to just be able to come together with the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Pentecostals, the, the Charismatics, whoever and everybody ought to be able to just say, look, you know, we... We got our own little thing we're doing, and we do it in a little different way, but we all got this thing the same way. We all got the blessings of God, the favor of God, redemption, salvation the same way by Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen. All right, let's look then at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10. I am the righteousness of God in Christ, not by anything I've done. Doesn't matter how righteous I am or how unrighteous I am, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm not, I'm not promoting you be unrighteous or nasty or hateful or anything else. I'm just saying you probably will be anyway at some time, even after you're born again. So blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, who is being persecuted for righteousness' sake? That doesn't even make sense. Why would you be persecuted for being righteous? Only if your definition of righteousness is your religious, your, your, your religious work, your, you know, you're thinking God's going to bless me because I, I dotted all my I's and crossed all my T's this week and I didn't screw up and I, I didn't get drunk and I didn't cuss out the, my neighbor and I, I didn't, you know, flip out in traffic or something. So God... You know, I can expect God's going to do something for me. No, it goes back to what we said before. It's never been about our righteousness. It's about his righteousness. It's never even been about our faith. It's been about our belief in his faith. Praise the Lord. All right, let's move on then to Romans chapter 10 and verses 10 and 11. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. You see that? Yep. You don't faith your way into righteousness. You believe. Mm -hmm. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That word salvation is sozo. So you, you believe what the finished work of Christ, and with your mouth you declare it, whether it's healing, whether it's deliverance, whether it's uh, you know, escaping hell, whether it's restored relationships, whatever it is, it all works the same way. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Because if you think about it, it would be impossible to be, uh, come up short or, or, or be ashamed or not have everything that God has promised you except that you don't believe what he promised. Amen? Amen? So obviously, from these scriptures, we need to be people of faith. And in order to do that, we need to ask and answer a question. What kind of faith did Jesus have? Because all the rest of it's irrelevant. 
Amen? Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 12. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So here's the deal. When we preach do's and don'ts, when we preach religious work, we're preaching against faith. I don't care how you try to whitewash it, it still comes out the same. There's only one or the other. It takes no faith to be religious. It just takes your hard work. It takes your effort. It takes your being able to deal with your own guilt and condemnation for not being able to do it like you should. Yeah. Amen? So the law is not a faith, but the man that does them has to live in it, has to live by that. Yeah. All right? Look at Romans chapter 14, verses 22 and 23. I told you I had a lot of scripture, but there is a lot of bogus teaching about faith and we, need to, we really need to understand what it is we're dealing with if we're going to see what God has promised us be fulfilled. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that commit, condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Have you got faith? Well, then, how about using it for yourself? And not believing that everything you do that isn't outlined in some particular doctrine doesn't condemn you. Right. How about believing that this is about a relationship between you and God and not about you keeping a list of do's and don'ts? Yes. If you got faith, then let's exercise it in your life, in, your, in the way you live your life, not being guilty and condemned all the time. Are you, under, are you hearing what I'm saying? You, you know, we, we say, well, you know, because we're so faithful or we have such faith, then we feel bad when we do bad. I get that. I mean, I understand that. But he's saying just the opposite. He's saying if you have faith, then how about showing it to yourself? So that when you do screw up, you don't beat yourself up for six months over it. You just move on and believe that Jesus is your justification. He is your redeemer. He is your savior. And he has made you righteous. Be a good place to start with faith instead of trying to believe, amen, for a new Maserati. How about believing that you don't have to, you know, be guilty and ashamed and, and depressed for a week because you just said something you shouldn't have said to your husband or your wife or the neighbor or whatever. Now, I haven't had a fight with my wife in a week, probably. I haven't kept track, but I know that it's usually in a cycle about like that. Praise the Lord. So I'm not preaching to this, you know, just to cover my own tracks. No. Verse 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, but whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So, let's look at this from the other side. So you're not going to go here or go there because you feel ashamed of it, or you think it's wrong, or you think it's, you know, it's, God's going to be angry about it. The fact that you're not doing it out of fear, you might as well do it. Because it's sin, because you don't believe God or trust God for his righteousness instead of your own. I'm not telling you to go do it. I'm telling you, if you think it's making you more righteous yeah. simply by not doing it, yeah. you miss the point. Right. Right. Amen? Because whatever is not of faith is sin. Which means when you're feeling guilty and you, you're thinking you're being all holy and righteous and sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you're actually sinning. You're denying what God has said about you. I, hey, I'm just saying we're, we've got contradictions here and we've declared these things to be true and we got, almost got to rewind the tape and back up and rethink everything about our relationship with God because the reason we're not seeing what it is we're supposed to be seeing is not because of God because it's a finished work as far as God's concerned. It's a question of our believing in his faithfulness and his faith and that's the reason why. Not to make you feel guilty, but to wake you up to the wrong thinking that brings about wrong consequences and wrong results. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we're talking about the faith of Jesus. And the faith of Jesus is something that he, not only does he give it, he responds to it. He's the author and finisher. 
He gives it to you, and then he responds to it when you believe in it. I mean, it's a win-win. You can't, you can't go wrong with this. Praise the Lord. What we call faith is actually belief. We think we got to conjure up, oh, listen, mix your faith with my faith. No, I don't need mixing my faith with your faith or anybody else's faith. I just need to believe in the faith of Jesus. I, I need to believe that he, in spite of what was set before him, he went to the cross. He, he suffered. He went through the whole thing because he believed that God would raise him from the dead and that he would be the firstborn of many brethren. I don't have to have faith for that. It's already done. I just need to believe that he did it and that he did it for me. All right, if that's true, then it's the same way for my healing. I don't need great faith for healing. I just need to believe that he suffered those stripes. He used his faith, amen, in order for me to be healed. All I got to do is believe it. Prosperity works the same way. Every area of our relationship with God operates based on the faith of Jesus Christ and our belief or unbelief of that fact. Praise the Lord. His power, the, the way you see it the clearest, is when believers declare, Lord, I believe. Yes. Simple as that. I don't know how. I can't analyze this thing. I can't figure it out. I just believe it because you said it. Yes. It simplifies everything for us. It takes all of our emotion out of it, all of our, I'm not saying you're not going to still get excited or maybe even a little depressed when things are going the wrong way. I'm just saying that really has nothing to do with it. You can be as depressed as you want to and still say, I believe it, Lord. I don't feel this. I'm aggravated. I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm depressed. I'm scared. But I still believe in you. I believe what you said is true. That's what David, that's what Job said. Though these skin worms devour me, yet I will believe. I will see him as he is. Yeah can't tell me Job wasn't depressed. I mean, it's depressing. Read the book. But, but he didn't let it didn't take away his belief in God. I'm sure his faith was like this. But he believed what God said. Abraham, you look at him and, and, and you say, man, that doesn't look like the kind of faith I think I need. Because his faith had him up and down. He, 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 didn't have, he got into a place where there was a drought. He didn't have faith to stay. He went to Egypt. But God said, he believed me and I called that righteous. I didn't, I didn't measure Abraham's faith. I measured Abraham's belief in me. In what I said I would do, he believed it. His faith was imperfect, but he continued to believe God. Hallelujah. So in the same way that we say, Lord, I believe, and we declare it, when we don't believe, the Bible shows us how that unbelief can stop miracles. It can stifle them. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 58. And see, we, we confuse it with faith all the time, but Jesus told his own disciples, you don't need more faith. It's unbelief that's the problem. If you got this kind of mustard seed faith, you can move mountains. You have to believe. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. This is the same Jesus that raised people from the dead. Same Jesus that, that, that stopped storms. Same Jesus that kicked Satan out of heaven. Cast out demons. Same one. He wrote this, I didn't. He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Right. Right. They didn't believe in him, right. in his ability, his, his faithfulness to do it. Right. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of, again, Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. 
All right? Knowing a man is not justified by the works of the law. That you, you, it doesn't work that way. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Not, not his, God's, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Think about, it. just think of the, the, the stress that would be relieved if we actually applied that to our lives. It's not about my faith. As far as my faith is concerned, I'm dead. All I got to do is believe in the one who's living in me. Praise the Lord. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? Hebrews 11, 16, or 11, 6. And there's another place where it says, will, will he find faith when he comes? Whose faith? How are we going to prove it? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. How many times has that freaked you out? God's not pleased with me now because of my faith. Without the faith of Jesus, there is absolutely no way for us to please God. But because of the faith of Jesus, we are pleasing in his sight. Yes. We are his beloved children in whom he is well pleased. Yes. Why? Because we simply believe on him. Yes. Not just Jesus, but on him who sent him. Yes. Amen. Before Jesus was Jesus, God. After Jesus was Jesus, still God. Amen. 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 We believe in God. We believe on whom he has sent. We believe the words that he has spoken. He is the word of God made flesh. Yes. Yes. Now you can understand why we say things like without believing in him, it's impossible to be saved. Why? Because the word of God is what saves you. You cannot know the Father, without knowing Jesus. Right. You can know a generic God. You can know whatever kind of God you want to make up, but you can't know God right. unless you know Christ. Right. Right. He is the exact representation, manifestation, presentation of God. Yes. So there is no way to God except through Him. It only, it's only logical. Right. Right. It isn't being biased and and you know, mean-spirited and, and all that. No, it's, hey, look, it's up to you, but if you want to, if you don't want to die in your sins, this is the only way out. Yes. Right. Exactly. It's a, I'm doing you a favor. I'm not trying to be a bigot. I'm not trying to be a, a Islamophobe or, a, you know, whatever. Right. I'm saying, this is, this is the only way. Right. All right, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. He's made it so easy. We complicate it with all of our stupidity, the, the wisdom of man, the foolishness of God. Looking unto Jesus, as I said earlier, the author and finisher of our faith. That means it didn't start with you. It doesn't end with you. So it would lead one to believe that there isn't a whole lot in between that has much to do with you either. Right? I mean, if it, didn't, if it wasn't created by you and, you and it doesn't come to fulfillment by you, then you can't be really doing much sustaining of it in between. So looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and set down the right hand of the throne of God. Why? By faith is how he did it. You never had to do that. You'll never have to do that. All you've got to do is believe on him who did it. That's the good news, praise the Lord. All right, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. I'm taking a little roundabout way here, but that's only because we've got to unravel some of our thinking before we can even get to, to some of the things. That, like Jesus said, you know, how can I talk to you about spiritual things? And I'm not implying that I, you know, that's where I'm at. I'm just saying... The example is, he said, I, I, there's stuff I'd like to talk to you about, but your, your core beliefs are so fouled up that until we unravel all this religious uh, Judaism yep. misunderstanding, yep. 
it's going to be difficult for me to talk to you about the spiritual things. Because you're still so stifled and, and, and uh, stuck in this legalistic way and thinking that you're going to do it. That it's impossible for me to lead you beyond that. So here he says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. How difficult is that to understand? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. I know we'd say, well, that means then, then only the Baptists have it, or only the Pentecost. And that's not what he's talking about here, faith. The only faith there is is God's faith, the faith of Jesus Christ. Because all the rest of this refers to Jesus. Yes. Baptism yes. is about being baptized into Christ. Yes. Right? Yes. One Lord. The Shema. You know, the, the, the Hebrew that all Jews learn. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Yes. That didn't change with Christianity. Right. One baptism. One faith. It all points back to him. It's always going to point to him. Praise the Lord. So, uh, a lot of Christians, most Christians, I would say, have bought into a notion of faith that it isn't consistent with Jesus and what he teaches about it. It just isn't. Now, so let's, let's reimagine faith in a fresh way, in a, in a different way. What faith is and what faith isn't. Right? Mark chapter 11, and let's read verses 12 through 24. You all know the story, but we're going to read it just for the sake of uh, context here. Mark 11, verses 12 through 24. By the way, I appreciate everybody's testimonies this morning because we see what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. We know what he will do based on what he is doing or what he has already done. Someone already mentioned that, but these are the landmarks talked about in the Old Testament. Whenever something would happen, they put down a put down a stone, put down something, make a landmark to remind you of what God did this day. Because I promise you, the day's coming when you're going to think He's not there. When you see the giants, you're going to think, "Oh God, big giants." Amen. You're going to forget that He already whipped the Pharaoh and his army and uh, you know all these other forces that you couldn't overcome. So that's why. That's why he gives us these things to sustain us for the next battle, for the next challenge, for the next lie of the enemy. Amen? So, and on the morrow, when they, uh, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, he being Christ. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought him how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. So the background of this story, it's important. It's important because... When we, we see through this the genius of Jesus. Amen. We see what how he looks at finding faith. Praise the Lord. Jesus wrote, wrote into Jerusalem. And he's going to Jerusalem for Passover. This is, the, this is the story. But it's late when he gets there. So he decides to stay in Bethany overnight. 
You ever go to Iowa City the night before a ball game? Might be easier to stay somewhere besides Coralville or Iowa City. You might want to stay back a few miles so you can find a hotel if you hadn't had the sense enough to get one in advance. Because there's no place to stay. It's crowded. It's, it's a mess. That's what Jesus, Passover, everybody's coming to Jerusalem. He gets there. He decides, ooh, the crowds, the, the noise, the whole mess. We'll go back to Bethany and stay there tonight and come back tomorrow. So that's what they do. So the next day, he heads back to Jerusalem. And he gets hungry on the way. Now, there aren't any restaurants. There's no quick trips. There's no Casey's. There's no grocery stores. So he's looking for a tree because that's where you're going to find food that you don't have to chase it down, wrestle it, stick a knife in it, cook it, and everything else. So he's the, the quickest way to find food there, look for a tree with some fruit and go get it. So that's what he's doing. He, he has to find a tree with fruit on it. And so he sees a fig tree, and it's in bloom, or at least it has leaves on it, and so he goes for the fruit. Amen? But when he gets close, he sees there's nothing on it but leaves. So he speaks to the tree, and he says, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. Now, here's where we need to focus, because Jesus never says anything for no reason. And throughout his ministry, trees were used as metaphors for people. Right. Amen. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 20. And I'm saying Jesus was not only speaking to his day, but whenever Jesus spoke, he was speaking prophetically as well as into the moment. So yeah, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And we know trees just put out the fruit that's there, right? A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that belong, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits you show them. That's a metaphor for people, right? All right, here's another one, John chapter 15 and verse 5. There's others, but I'm just picking out a couple of them so you know that this is the fact. John 15 and, and verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can't do anything. So obviously, he's talking about people again and their relationship with him, right? So keep in mind then, Jesus cursing the fig tree in Matthew 11 is a metaphor for people, including religious people. In fact, I would say more likely religious people than anybody else. All right? So what if Jesus is talking about these people? What if he's saying the problem with these people is their withering faith? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. The reason there's no fruit, if he's using trees as a metaphor, maybe he's saying the reason there's no fruit is because they have very little faith. Their faith has withered, right? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Mm. Now remember, we've already, dis we've already discovered this is not faith about my faith. It's we've given up on his faith. Yeah. We've stopped believing that by his stripes we were healed. We've stopped believing that we will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. We have stopped believing that we will do greater works. We will raise the dead. We've stopped believing that whatever we set our hand to will prosper. That's what he's talking about here. All right? What if Jesus is using the, this tree to talk about the stifled faith in religion? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 and 21. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. That's also... That's also uh, uh, I don't want to say theology, but philosophy, which is religion. I'm not talking about relationship here, but when you get into religion, you're just dealing with another philosophy, and that's what that word is. And so he said, keep that which was committed to your trust. What was that? We trust in the faith of Christ, the truth, the gospel, right? Avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of philosophies falsely so-called, which some profess 
have erred concerning the faith. They've gotten off into their philosophies and into their theologies, and they've erred then concerning the faith. Grace, now he just summarizes the whole thing right there. Grace be with thee. Amen. So be it. Praise the Lord. So after all, now in the back to the story, here's the deal. Jesus is hungry for food. Just like people are hungry for the word of God. Doesn't the Bible say in the last days there will be a famine, but not for want of bread, but for the word of God. For the truth, in other words, of what the word is actually telling us. You can't say that without disassociating Christ from it. So it's people that are not believing that Jesus is the total answer, that in him is all fullness, that in him dwelleth all the, the reality of God, that in him comes every blessing the finished work is what I'm talking about. All right? So Jesus goes to this place, and he goes there, and, he, and, and in his mind and in anybody else's mind, they would suppose then that that place would be able to sustain him, feed him, right, this, this tree. But when he gets to it, he finds out it has no fruit, just leaves. Just ornamentation. Looks pretty. The tree looks good from a distance, but at closer inspection, he realizes it's useless if it's fruitless. Yes. Praise the Lord. I heard someone say the other day, you know, Nathan looks pretty good from a distance. <laughs> I don't know if they meant that as a compliment or what they meant, but I get it. Because the further I stand from the mirror, the better I look. And the closer I get, the, yeah, I'm thinking, who is the man in there? But it's the truth. Jesus, from a distance, it looked inviting. It looked like, hey, there it is. It's beautiful green, and I'm going to get there. And, and he gets there, and it's just a big show. It looks good, but there's nothing there to sustain him. There's nothing there to feed him. Uh -huh. Amen? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. What's the power of God? It's a gospel. What's the gospel? Grace. Mm -hmm. yep. we got a form of godliness. It looks godly because... They got a steeple, they got a cross, they've got music, they're doing all the stuff, and they got all the rules and regulations that deny the power of God. That are putting you in charge by what you do or don't do. Now I'm not mad at anybody, so don't misunderstand me. I'm just being honest. I'm just saying, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He came to set us free. Amen. It was for freedom. That Jesus set us free. Now that is a complete contradiction if you look at this in any other way. Yes. Yeah. Amen. So Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why did thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Mm. Verse 20. Not, excuse me. Uh, verse 9. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They think they're worshiping him, and he's saying it's vanity. It's, it's useless. It's Unproductive. They, they're, they're not worshiping me because they're all hung up in their rules. The traditions of men. So Jesus could tell that based on the season, this tree ought to have fruit on it. Amen? But he also knew that because we could say this is like uh, October in Iowa, if there aren't any apples on the tree, you can bet there won't be any in November. Right? If they aren't there by September and October, they sure aren't going to find any out there in November or December. Exactly. 
And that's what Jesus is really saying. He's basing on, on, this, on this season that they're not going to have any fruit next month or the month after that. Right. The tree had a deficiency. Right. And that deficiency would continue to deceive people if it remained standing there. Yes. Praise the Lord. No fruit meant no life. So Jesus cursed the tree so it wouldn't deceive anybody else. Now we're getting serious, praise the Lord. He wanted it to wither so that people wouldn't keep running there to get fed and leave with unmet expectations. They wouldn't keep going there expecting they're going to be fed and go away hungry, go away unsatisfied, go away discouraged, depressed. Remember, this isn't about a tree. This is a metaphor about religious systems that need to be cut down if they deceive people into believing a dead tree has abundant fruit. Jesus is clearly frustrated with Israel. And remember, Israel was the church of the day. It was the church of his, of his time. So it makes sense why in the middle of the tree scenario, Mark shifts to a scene where Jesus is cleaning out the wickedness in the temple. Because it doesn't make sense if you're just looking at the context of this story about the fig tree, and then all of a sudden he hops from the story about the fig tree, and now all of a sudden it's, the whole focus is on this Jesus cleansing the temple. The temple was like the fig tree. Now Jesus' issue wasn't with the system of sacrifice because that's the system that was in effect at the time. It really wasn't even about the money stuff. Right. What it was about was the temple was like the fig tree because the issue was the thieving and the trickery and the falseness and the fakery that was going on right. in the church. Right. Right. If you could bet your life there were plenty of Jews standing around outside saying, a dove for three and a half bucks. This is a ripoff. <laughs> but I got to have one because I can't afford a lamb. I got to have something. Otherwise, I'm going to hell. And this shyster is telling me the only way I can get saved, the only way I can get is by his dove. That's, I'm, I'm just saying that's what, that's what the Lord is looking at here. So Jesus starts cutting down trees, figuratively. Mm -hmm. All right, so the evening comes, and Jesus goes out of the city again, and they see that fig tree, but now it's withered, right? right. Mark chapter 11, verse 21 and Peter calling to remember it saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. That's, to me, that is an unlikely response or an un, you know, it, it's an unexpected one at least. Right. Until you put it all together in context, until you look at the the big picture of what's going on there. Amen? The encounter with the tree wasn't just about the tree. Right. It wasn't just about any people. Exactly. It was also about the disciples. Yes. Yes. Jesus didn't say, have faith. He said, have faith in God. Right. Your faith is only as strong as what or whom you're believing in. When Jesus talks about faith, what is it, what's he really mean? And, and when we say faith and when Jesus says faith, are we talking about the same thing? When the Pharisees spoke of faith, they connected faith to keeping, observing, doing, following the rules. That was their idea of faith. 
Their goal was to obey the Torah like it was some kind of a science test or, or, or an experiment of some kind. See if you can do it. Here, follow these steps, and we'll see if it works out in the lab. It became something totally separate from God, really. I mean, from the relationship. It was just all about an exercise. So what does Jesus mean by faith? Faith is simply acting like God is telling the truth. Now look, we know this. The reason I know that we know this is because that's what everybody already said this morning. Now we know it innately by the Spirit, and yet we act out from a, from a bogus kind of you know, teaching. But the Spirit knows exactly. That's why when we're testifying, the Spirit is speaking and you're getting the witness from one person to the next. You hear truth ringing, you know. That's why it's important that we have testimonies. That's why it's important that we share what the Holy Spirit, you know, encourages us to share. Yes. Because it's the truth. Yes. Even though it may be a contradiction to how we're doing from moment to moment, sure. there is a truth that is in us. Yes. Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's a truth in us that cannot be changed. It cannot be altered. Right. Cannot be denied. Amen. So faith doesn't create God's will. Faith simply achieves God's will. Right. And again, I'm talking about the faith that we've already described as belief. I can believe whatever I want to, but it's not going to change the will of God. Right? right? right. But if I believe the will of God, that will change things. Amen? In other words, my believing doesn't create the will of God. It already exists. It's already finished. My believing manifests it. My believing achieves the will of God. So our faith has to trust that grace is enough. Our faith has to trust that it reconciled us to God. Not we, but He. See, it's possible to have faith to be saved, and we all know this because of all the different denominations and everything. It's possible to have faith or to believe in Christ for salvation, but not believe for a transformed life. Again, I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm talking about a life transformed, meaning now all needs are met. Health, wholeness. Whether it's financial, whether it's spiritual, physical, whatever it is. So I can believe for going to heaven, but I can't believe for any heaven here on earth. I don't have enough faith. It takes absolutely no faith except the faith of God to be saved. It just takes you believing that what he has done was for you. Praise God. In Galatians 3, Paul is trying to get this church, the, the church in Galatia, to see that they had believed in faith. They had believed in the faith of Christ to save them. Amen? Amen. They believed in his faith to start this transformative work. In other words, to take them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, right. into the kingdom of God where everything is already finished where it's already in us, accomplished, right? So they believe for the, for the initial truth, but they would started trusting in themselves to complete it. They started then having more faith in them than in him. Right. Right. All right, Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. We're just about done here. Chapter 13, 55 through 58. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Right. What, why did they not believe? 
because they didn't believe that he was the anointed one. All the faith in the world wouldn't have helped them because they had to believe in his faith. And they thought, he's just this carpenter's son. What's he going to do for us? The best we could hope for is a little magic show. Right? I mean, that's, and because of that, he didn't do many mighty works. Not because of their lack of faith, but because of their unbelief in his faith. In his faithfulness to God, in his oneness, in that connection with God. So the truth is, actually in this, it really is what you see is what you get. You see a carpenter's son? Unbelief. You see God has all power? He said, whatever you believe, you'll receive. See, it's in, it's in the strengthening of our faith that Christ is realized. Does that make sense to you? Again, I'm using faith and belief for us as synonymous terms. But it's in believing that our faith is strengthened, that we believe for more. Right? I mean, the more you believe in Jesus, the more real he is. The more you can believe for. If you only believe for salvation... In terms of going to heaven, that's good, I guess, because you're going to go to heaven. Yeah. But if you can believe bigger, if you can believe that he also suffered those stripes for your healing, not only now can you receive healing, but Jesus becomes bigger. Yeah. Jesus becomes better. Yeah. He becomes more loving. He becomes more concerned about you. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. It's, a, it's a circle. It's a cycle. Yeah. Faith isn't about the reward but about knowing the God of the reward. That's why Christian television and Christianity in general, we have such struggles because we've got it all backwards. Right. Mm-hmm. We've got the cart in front of the horse. Yeah. We believe he's telling the truth. Yes. We believe he is faithful. Yes. When I'm not faithful, he's still faithful. Yes. I can believe in him. When I cannot believe in myself. And because of that, we are infused. We we are empowered to speak to mountains. To tell them where to go. One more scripture. Mark chapter 11, 22 and 23. So look in the context of all that he's been talking about and then see how he wraps it all up here. And Jesus answered, say it unto them, have faith in God. For I say unto you, if you have this confidence in God, not in your acceptability and all the other things, but just simply faith in him, trusting in God's faithfulness, I say to you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. If he believes God will do it, then whatever he says, God will do it. As long as it's not contradicting the will will of God. Praise the Lord. The faith that Jesus demonstrated is way more achievable than we've ever dreamed, than we ever realized. He's telling us, greater works than these shall you do. How? If you believe God, if you have faith in God. Believe that it's done. Believe that it's the will of God for your healing. Believe it's the will of God for you to prosper. Amen? If you want to be like Jesus, how many want to be like Jesus? We've been trying most of our lives. We've cleaned up. We've done all kinds of different stuff. Got rid of things. Got some other things. Didn't go and did go and did all kinds of stuff to be more like Jesus. You want to be like Jesus? There's only one thing you have to do. Believe God. Believe God. And he says, righteousness. Who's righteous? Jesus. The righteousness of God has become ours. And we get the benefit of every bit of it by simply believing God instead of circumstances, instead of religion, instead of people, instead of lawyers and doctors. We believe God. And we can say to the mountain then, whatever the mountain is, get out of here 
out of my way. Amen? Amen. Let's give him a hand clap. Yes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So let's, let's focus. Amen? Focus on him. He's everything. He's all that there is. Nothing else you've got to worry about but believing in him. He did all the work, literally all the work. Just believe it. Praise the Lord. God bless all of you. Thanks again for being here. Have a great week in the Lord. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless all of you. Be sure and shake hands with our visitors. They praise the Lord. Glad you were with us. <laughs>